Welcome, this is Senior English B, and uh, this morning we are introducing the poetry of Lord Byron. You ought to be in your hymnals on page 834. And uh, I want to make some general kinds of observations before we actually get specifically to uh, the uh, poetry in your hymnal of Lord Byron. Uh, I want to start by first of all saying that we are studying the English Romantics. This again you should have in your notes. We are studying the English Romantics. We uh, begin our conversation about the English Romantics with what writer, don't say it, write it down. What writer, and again here you may be working already at 3A, what writer did we begin with? I'll give you a hint, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began, so is it now I am a man, so be it when I shall grow older, let me die. The child is father of the man, and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. What was his name? Wordsworth, who wrote Ten Turn Abbey, wrote My Heart Leaps Up, wrote The World is Too Much With Us, Late and Soon, Getting and Spending, We Lay Waste Our Powers, and all of that wonderful ditties. Then we went from Wordsworth to his close pal who? Write it down, don't say it. And what was the name of the poem that we worked with? We worked with two of his offerings, you'll remember. We just tested over that intel, right? The first, of course, was the crazy old man who shot an albatross out of the sky. That was what story? The rhyme, not story, rhyme. The rhyme of the ancient mariner. And, and as well, what was the other poem by, by this guy? <laughs> Kubla Khan, and this guy's name was what? Coldridge. Samuel Taylor Coldridge. Now, for your notes, let's say this real quickly. We divide the English Romantic poets up into two categories. We actually call them two generations. Generation one poets, generation two poets. I like to think of the generation one poets as kind of being the old farts and the generation two poets as being what we call the young hellions. We'll understand more about that when I explain it. We missed, by the way, a couple of generation one names. We actually began our semester not with Wordsworth, Although he's the high point of Generation One poets, who did we begin with? Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience, by what poet? Do you remember his name? Blake. Blake, that's right. Outstanding, Mr. Frederick. You should extra <coughs> points on your test sheet, I think, for that. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, Blake. We also, along with Blake, saw a Scottish poet who told us about a little mouse's nest that he turned upside down, the best laid plans of mice and men soon off do go awry. Do you remember who that poet was? Burns. That was Burns. So let's now list the Generation 1 poets in that order. One, Blake. Two, Burns. Three, Wordsworth. Four, Coldridge. That is to say, all of the poets we've been working with to this point are what we would call Generation 1 poets. They are a little <laughs> bit more old fart type, a little bit more old school. The second generation of poets are the young Hellions, or sometimes what we call the young guns. They are in order, Byron, Shelley, and Keats. Byron, Shelley, and Keats. Now these three poets taken collectively are really the holy trinity of kind of Hellions, they, and they are, they are. Let's identify all three of them sharing common, Byron, Shelley, and Keats, several things. One, they all die young tragically young, not unlike Jimi Hendrix, not unlike Jim Morrison, not unlike Janis Joplin, and not unlike Kurt Cobain, a little before your time. All of these musicians burned the candle at both ends, they sometimes say, and they wore their bodies out way too quickly. Of course, their drug consumption did not help their cause, and ultimately they all died tragically young. The young gun hellions of the second generation are all the same way. Byron, Shelley, and Keats all die before their time. I would say this, though. Before they die, they produce, arguably, some of the greatest poetry in all of the English language. We'll talk about them now in order, beginning with Byron. Okay? So let's go to Byron first. Of all three of the young gun Hellion poets, Byron is the most crazy. All right? He is, without a doubt. Byron is a great experimenter. Uh, this is our PG-13 version here. Byron is a great experimenter of all things. Okay? Of all things. 
Whatever it is you can come up with, Byron's pretty much going to be the cat that says, dude, I've never done that, let's try that. That's Byron, okay? So Byron, both in his physical life, as well as in his emotional, compositional life, is an experimenter. He's going to do all kinds of, uh, of experimenting. Byron himself lives a pretty kind of crazy life. He ends up kind of exiling himself to a place <coughs> called Geneva. He has bank. His family has money and lots of it. So, for example, he spends quite a bit of his life uh, living on an island that he created with a mansion on it, okay? Um, and the only way you can get there is to get in a boat and sail across his little, his little uh, lake that was created for him to get to his little island where his huge mansion is. This is this cat. But he gets kind of bored and stuff, and so he goes off to fight in the wars of another country, and he ends up dying. You've already read the biography of the guy. One of the, one of the ways, I always try and give you one thing to kind of tie in to remember. Um, for example, with Wordsworth, I told you you like to go on those long walking tours. With Byron, the interesting thing is he's born with what's called a club foot. That means that one of his legs isn't correctly uh, anatomically um, quite right, and his foot goes out so that he has a limp. And when he gets to school, a uh, high school basically, what we would call high school, um, they you know they do that thing called PE or whatever, and the kids make fun of him because he can't run properly. It makes him so angry that he learns how to run in spite of his limp, and he, before he leaves high school, outruns all of them in a famous race. He outruns all of them, the guys who made fun of him. He, got, he, he taught his, himself how to become fast enough to be able to outrun them. This tells you a little bit of the cat. I mean, he's very much about um, trying to prove that he can do whatever. The other thing we should say is that Lord Byron enjoys company with women. And let's say it this way, a number of women. And it will be Lord Byron who in many ways invents that stereotype of the morose artist who kind of sits in a flat in New York City, uh, you know, um, and, and, kind of, and kind of paints his stuff or writes his stuff or smokes lots of cigarettes and is very morose. And, you know, you've seen him in movies, these stereotype kind of <coughs> artist types. We will call it today the Byronic hero from Byron. The Byronic hero. This hero is a very special kind of cat. He is not your normal hero, okay? He's not like a normal hero. Instead, he's like a guy who you kind of feel sorry for, but then you don't. And the fact that you feel sorry for him is only going to make him disgust you even more, okay? This is the Byronic hero. Of course, the most famous representation of the Byronic hero is his hero, Byron's hero in a, in a long poem called Don Juan. Don Juan, of course, is a guy who has all kinds of sexual <coughs> escapades, goes through all of these adventures, and what do you know? In each one of these adventures, there's usually a girl or, in one case, 5,000 girls. So, I mean, you know, it all depends, you see. On the, it all depends, right? It will therefore not shock you that when we get to page 834 and we take a look at the poem on 834 and then we go to 836 and we take a look at the poem on 836, it will not shock you that both of these poems, big shock, deal with women. Okay? And, and, so, and so I'm going to give you a tie-in here for your annotations for both of these poems. In both of these poems, he's dealing with girls, guys and girls, guys and girls. What we'll do in the first poem is we'll ask a simple question. At, I'm, I'm going to give you a 3B question. At Worland High School, what is it that guys most look at first when they evaluate a girl to determine whether she's good looking or not? <coughs> Lang just does this. <laughs> I'm not going to get into it, Mr. Judice, okay? No, I'm not going to get into it, okay? So, uh, Cruz Nicholas goes right. Uh, so that'll be the first question. In the second poem at Worland High School, notice how hard I'm trying to make these poems somewhat relevant. At Worland High School, who do you think it is the case that breaks up more? <coughs> is it the guy's idea or more, or the girl's idea at Worland High School, who is usually the one responsible for jacking the other one, predominantly is it the guys at Worland High School that kind of go, okay, we're done with this project, or is it the girls who say, we've you know, been dating for a while, I think it's time we become friends, 
right? Which is code language for you just got jacked, okay? So, um, right? So, uh, so we'll debate both of those. Let's take a look at 834. Read it with me now. She walks in beauty. These become really famous poems. I should point out, Byron is a genius at the traditional craft of poetics. If you're interested in writing poetry, you've got to study the poetics of, of Lord Byron. Notice he'll play games with rhythm and rhyme and all of that, but he also is going to be very experimental. Let's take a look at it. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes, thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place. And on that cheek, and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, and tell of days and goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. By the way, take a look at the opening lines. I just want to point this out. I wish I had more time. I would, I would go into this in more detail with you. Notice the opening lines. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies. How to read poetry, 101. Notice, if you read poetry by reading the line, you're not going to understand often what's being said. Take a look at the first two lines. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies. Well, the problem is that that two lines is actually one thought. So when you read it, you want to make sure that you read the second line along with the first line right away. Take a look at it. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless <coughs> climes and starry skies. Do you got me? Okay, so we want to point that out right away. Reading poetry is not about reading the line, but reading the thought vis-a-vis -vis the punctuation. Notice there's no punctuation after the word night. Which means, Mr. Brown, right away, you're not going to pause at the end of night. You're going to keep reading. But notice at the end of skies, there is a semicolon, which means you will pause. But notice at the end of the third line, the word bright, no punctuation. Do you see it? So that means you're going to read it as, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. And now all of a sudden, the thought starts to make sense. Secondly, let's talk about real quickly the rhythm. Uh, some of these observations will end up in, on the exam, I know, that's why I'm pointing them out to you. Let's talk about rhythm real quickly. I can read it as she walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, or I can slow it down and do this thing called scanning the lines, S-C-A-N-N-I-N-G, scanning the lines. And, and here now we're trying to hear the rhythm of the line. Notice it. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. Ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. That we call iambic, a foot of iambic meter, okay? Ba bum, ba bum. We will see it all the way through the poem. Also, notice that you've got some rhyme scheme at the end of lines, right? So that, for example, night rhymes with bright, skies rhymes with eyes, correct? So we would call this a rhyme screen scheme of A, B, A, B, A, B. See how that works, right? So you have, notice, you have three pairs of lines that are separated and that have in rhyme. Okay, so that's the poetics. Welcome to the introduction of poetics in Lord Byron. But let's take a look at what it is he's saying. Notice the poem is constructed into three stanzas where in each stanza he looks at a different aspect of the girl that he really likes. Notice the very first line tells us that the first thing it is that he focuses on is her what? You miss, I, you're close, but keep going. <coughs> the opening line says that he looks at her what? Her walk, the way she walks, literally the way she carries herself. But what does it mean? Try and write this down at, le at level one for yourself. What does it mean when it says that she walks in beauty like the night. Remember, when we have a comparison using like or as, we call that a, you're right, Mr. Nelson, a simile. Uh, uh, what is the simile here that means, how can you walk like the night? She Physically, physically she, could, she could be a person of color. Absolutely. This is one way, this is one way to read this poem, no doubt. Uh, keep, going, keep going, though, Mr. Judice. What would it mean she walks in beauty like the night? 
Creeping, creeping, like so creeping is an interesting way to say it. Uh, That's weird. Silently, yeah. Quietly, quietly creep. silently. Oh. Chris Nicholas points out, let's make sure we understand, this is a tribute poem to her beauty. So the word creep carries with it a negative or pejorative meaning, right? Oh, um, really? You're here, just kind of sneaking along. Yeah, yeah, sneaking maybe is a little less pejorative. <coughs> but notice here, he's going to get to the way that she walks. Take a look at it. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climbs and starry skies. And all that's best of dark and bright meets in her aspect. What does that mean? The appearance, the appearance her physical face, and in her <coughs> eyes. So we've already met three things that he looks at when he looks at a woman. First her walk, then her face, and finally her eyes. Keep reading. Thus mellowed to the tender light, which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace, which waves in every raven tress. You don't maybe know this word tress. What are we talking about tress? It's her hair. What does raven mean? Black. So what color hair does she have? Very black hair. Notice the next thing that he says is her hair is beautiful. Does hair matter to guys that were all in high school and they look at a girl? Do you think? Does hair matter? Yeah, some of us say, yeah, it matters. Yeah. Does hair matter to girls when they look at guys? Yes. Yes, it works both ways. It works both ways. Notice... Her, her, her hair, line 10, softly lightens o'er her face, and now to her face, where thoughts <laughs> serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place. Her face is a very innocent face, we might say, right? And he kind of likes that. Now to the last one. And on that cheek, another aspect of her face, and or that brow, right? <clears throat> so soft, so calm, yet eloquent. Now, what does the word eloquent mean? He says he likes this girl because she's eloquent. Do you have any sense of what that means? What was it? I'm sorry? Smoking meaning physically attractive? Is that what you mean? Eloquent? What would eloquent mean? She speaks, she speaks with like very good kind of language. She shows, if you're eloquent, you show some level of sophistication. We might even say some level of cultural education. In other words, she can work a room at a party. She knows how to do that. She can walk into a room and people look at her and she kind of has a certain type of grace. Keep reading. So soft, so calm, yet eloquent. Uh-oh, the next line. What is it that he focuses on? I've had guys who say the most important thing in a girl is actually this next line, line 15, the smile. I got any guys that want to say that? The smile of a woman is the most important thing, some of us maybe say. The smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of, uh, tell in, uh, of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent, exclamation mark. So maybe we would say that about this woman, he will say, she is the complete package in every way. She not only is physically attractive, she has a certain element of sophistication, but as well, she, is, she uses the word innocent, 3A. What poet immediately do we think of when we think of this notion of innocence? Yeah, Blake, don't we, right? The idea that she is, she's innocent. Now, obviously, we can think about sexual innocence here, right? And that kind of thing, virginal and all of that. But there's also this other thing about maybe she has this ability to make him feel uh, like, he, you know, she wants to know about him. That is to say, she's innocent in regards to him. And she's interested in him. And he likes this about her. Notice she, he begins then, back to re-unpack this one more time. Notice She's mysterious, and yet somehow Excuse she is... Excuse the interruption. Uh, we are working on the intercom system this morning. We want to make sure that we can hear this in every room this morning uh, and the hallways. Obviously, we have the hallways covered. If you are not hearing this in your room, please call Maria's extension or any <laughs> <laughs> extension to let us know that you are not getting this in your room. Thank you. That, that's a good one. 